And joining us now on the line from Cambridge, Massachusetts, Megan L. O'Sullivan, the Jean Kirkpatrick Professor of the Practice of International Affairs at the John F. Kennedy School at Harvard University. And Professor O'Sullivan, as I welcome you to the program today, I actually want to start by reading something that you wrote in the July 2011 report entitled Iraqi Politics and Implications for Oil and Energy. Here we go. Iraq's ability to reach its energy potential should be of broad regional and international concern. Iraq could be poised for a dramatic transformation, one in which it finally escapes the political and technical constraints that have kept it producing less than 4% of the world's oil, despite having the third largest conventional oil reserves in the world. Should Iraq meet its ambitions to bring nearly 10 million more barrels of oil online by 2017, it would constitute the largest ever capacity increase in the history of the oil industry. Should Iraq more probably bring only half this capacity to market, it would still represent a massive achievement. Let's start by having you give us a sense of the magnitude of the challenge of increasing oil production by 10 million barrels in five years. Sure, and first uh, let me thank you, Steve, for having me on the show. And as you've suggested, this is an enormous undertaking that the Iraqis are, have embarked upon with the help of some international oil companies. Just to put some of those numbers in perspective, Iraq is producing about 2.7 million barrels of oil a day, exporting about 2.1 million. And this has been the case more or less um, over the last eight or so years since Saddam was ejected from power. Iraq really struggled to break out of the 2, 2.2, 2.5 uh, million barrels of oil a day. And so for Iraq to go from 2.7 million barrels of oil a day to upwards of 13 million barrels of oil a day is, again, an enormous uh, undertaking. And if we put this in the context of the global market, you'll get an even better sense of it. Um, the whole world today consumes a little shy of 90 million barrels of oil a day. Saudi Arabia produces about 10 million barrels of oil a day. So Iraq is talking about um, having the capacity to produce and producing more than Saudi Arabia, which with Russia is uh, the largest producer um, in the world. I wonder if this is one of these situations where we've got to watch what we wish for, because as you look around the world at the petro states, uh, in terms of democracies, they're not doing very well. We want Iraq to get better and to be a bigger oil exporting country, but on the other hand, you know, will that be consistent with their efforts to be a more democratic country? Well, this is a very good concern that you raise. And first, let me say um, that very few people, including, I would say, many Iraqis, believe that Iraq will get close to that 12 million barrels of oil a day. So it's really a question of where they're going to fall between their current capacity today and the capacity that they aspire to. Um, on the point that you're making, there's something um, called the resource curse, which many of your viewers may be aware of. And this is not just an academic concept, but it's a real world concept that says countries that have resource wealth, be it oil or gold or diamonds, often don't translate that wealth into stability or into uh, growth or prosperity for their citizens. And certainly there's many reasons to worry that Iraq could gain in their ability to produce oil, get more revenues for the sale of oil, but not in the end translate this into a meaningfully better existence for their people. Now, we certainly hope this is not the case, but there are a variety of things that would lead um, any observer to be a little bit nervous about Iraq's institutional capacity to manage such potentially huge growth in, um, in their oil revenues over the next decade or so. Help us better understand as well something that you've written where you wrote that Iraq's energy strategy is also their foreign policy strategy and their security strategy. What does all that mean? Sure. Well, the, the big amounts of oil we're talking about and the revenue that comes with it. Uh, for 2012, Iraq has a budget of about $100 billion. And if they doubled or tripled uh, their oil capacity, depending on prices, this means their budget could grow by similar proportions. They need that oil to develop their own country after 30 years of sanctions, Saddam, oppression, war, 
um, everything that's happened in the last eight or nine years. So their ability to translate their resource wealth, their geological wealth, into actual revenues matters for how their internal society develops um, and whether they're able to invest in infrastructure and health and education and all the things that could make Iraq, um, bring Iraq back to its status as a regional uh, leader in these dimensions that it used to be in the 50s. But it also has major implications for Iraq's, as you said, foreign policy, for how Iraq relates to other countries in the region in particular. And um, I could talk to you a little bit about how Iraq's ability to translate this oil into, uh, into meaningful production could help mitigate tensions in the region. You could imagine an Iraq that is using its oil wealth to help neighbors uh, deal with their deficit in energy, take it, uh, be it Jordan or um, gas poor Kuwait. Kuwait's currently importing gas through a pipeline from Qatar. It would make a lot more sense just to use the pipeline that actually exists between Iraq and Kuwait across the border. And you can imagine Iraq using its energy to play an integrating role. Alternatively, you can imagine there being a lot of competition between Saudi Arabia and Iran and Iraq in particular as Iraq starts to bring more oil online. And that could, depending on the state of international oil markets, um, have some implications for the price that all the other producers get for the oil that they sell. Well, when it comes to the Middle East, no one ever lost money betting things would get worse. So where's your money going? Well, I, I think it all depends on uh, what your time frame is and what exactly you're referring to. Um, certainly, I think there are parts of the Middle East that are going to be in a period of uh, a state of uh, great uncertainty for the short to medium term. And I think a lot of that has to do with consolidating new regimes after, uh, after the Arab Spring. Over the long term, I'm very optimistic that uh, the Arab world will find its feet and find a way of having more uh, representative governments for the people um, of these countries. In the short term, um, this could lead to, to greater conflict, greater uncertainty, um, or certainly uh, just a, a lot more um, a, a lot more questions that remain um, between countries and between the United States and the Middle East. Um, in terms of Iraq, I think uh, that's a different bundle of goods because Iraq is in a different place than a lot of these countries that have experienced recent res uh, revolutions. And in Iraq actually, just within the last few weeks, is experiencing a political crisis and the way that this political crisis is resolved in the wake of the withdrawal of U.S. troops, I think will really set the trajectory for Iraq um, for the coming years. Okay, then if Iraq is going to achieve some of the targets that you've suggested or even get halfway there, presumably they need some infrastructure that is adequate to the task and some human capital, uh, the professionals on site to be able to get them there. Right. How are they doing on those two metrics? Well, most people, um, particularly people in the oil industry, if you talk to them about what the major obstacles are, you know, why is it that people look at these uh, oil contracts that would have Iraq producing 12 or 13 million barrels of oil a day over a seven to 10 year time period. Why are people not at all optimistic that Iraq can reach those levels? They generally point to infrastructure shortages and a variety of other factors. On the infrastructure front, I would say that's probably the largest constraint. And that is um, quite distinct from the ability to get more oil out of the ground, is the ability to get that oil to export markets. And of course, um, what we're looking at is that Iraq is doing a little bit better in getting oil out of the ground than it is in building the pipelines that bring that oil um, for 80% of Iraq's oil exited, exits through um, the Gulf. And there, there's a shortage of pipelines and what's called single mooring points um, to export that production. So that's, uh, I would say, the long pole in the tent. But there are a whole variety of other logistical factors, um, be it having sufficient water to inject into the fields to boost their production, or um, simple things like bureaucratic uh, finessing of visas and other issues that are really creating um, what seem to be minor problems for the international oil companies, but in practice amount to a whole series of delays and uh, frustrations. So I think it's a variety of logistical and technical factors that will make this difficult. And then, of course, there's the whole basket of political issues that will also um, determine whether 
whether or not Iraq is able to translate its geological wealth into actual um, exports. Well, let me add one more thing to the mix. To, you know, for professionals who go to work in Iraq, can they do so relatively secure in the knowledge that they're not going to be blown up at some point during their day? Sure. Um, I think what, one of the things that may be important for your viewers to understand is just where all this oil activity happens. Um, the overwhelming amount of oil that's produced in Iraq is produced in the southern part of the country, pretty significantly far south. It's about 80 percent of the production and exports uh, is very far from Baghdad and have traditionally, or I mean in the last eight years or so, been in places where there hasn't been the kind of sectarian violence that um, your viewers have become familiar with. So when you hear about bombings in Baghdad, that creates a very tense political environment and a, de a de deteriorating security environment in the capital, but it won't necessarily translate into security problems uh, for oil workers in the South. We have seen in the last month or so some targeted attacks on oil infrastructure in the South, which is quite worrying for people who are really gauging whether this political crisis will translate into a security crisis which could have implications for the oil industry. But thus far, um, we have uh, the security deterioration, which is largely focused in the capital, um, and then you have, in the north of the country, uh, the non-Kurdish areas, and then the south, where a lot of the oil has gone on in relatively peaceful areas. Okay. This may be a bit of a chippy question for somebody who used to work in the Bush administration, but hang in there for me anyway. Sure. The the war in Iraq, at the end of the day, was it all about the oil, in your view? Well, you won't be surprised that I can't answer that question uh, in one sentence. I think mm -hmm. people tend to stay away from the topic um, because whenever you put Iraq and oil in the same sentence, people either leap to one end of the spectrum or the other. They say um, it was all about oil or it had nothing to do with oil. And what I try to highlight to people is really the importance of making the distinction between having commercial interests in Iraq's oil and having strategic interests in Iraq's oil and Iraq's place in the region. Now, I think if we look at the question, well, did America uh, go into Iraq, invade Iraq in 2003 for commercial reasons? Did it want to take control of Iraq's oil or did it want to own that oil um, in some way. I think the track record, if you look at it, it's fairly clear that actually um, the Americans didn't use their position of military and political authority to immediately try to translate that into getting control over Iraq's resources. I was uh, living in Iraq and working for the U.S. government during the entire occupation and the one area that we stayed away from was oil. We worked with the Iraqis to make laws about a variety of things, but generally said we need to wait for an elected sovereign government to make any decisions about what Iraq does with its oil, because we realize the sensitivities. Now, on the strategic side, it's a little bit of a different calculation. America and the world cares about Iraq, cares about the Middle East, in part, not entirely, but in part because so much of the world's oil wealth is concentrated in that area. And when you think about the first Gulf War, you know, certainly some of that was about the strategic importance of oil. When Saddam invaded Kuwait, he actually became in control of 17 or so percent of the world's oil res uh, reserves. Um, and then if he had invaded Saudi Arabia, that would have been more than 40 percent of the world's oil. And so, of course, the world was concerned about that and what that could mean for the global economy, what that could mean for regional stability, all of those things. So you could make the argument in 2003 that there was strategic importance about Saddam and, uh, and the, the oil wealth of Iraq um, on a strategic dimension, which is different than a commercial dimension. The real um, issue, I think, today is what are the strategic interests of the international community vis-a-vis -vis Iraq? And there are some strategic interests which do relate to oil. All right, we've got about a minute to go here, so let me try one last thing with you. And that is, which type of Iraqi state, in your view, a federal state or a centralized state, is better for Iraq's energy future? Well, I think uh, this is the number one question in Iraq today. Is it going to be a federal state 
or is it going to really tack towards being a traditional centralized Arab state? And a lot of these ambiguities are playing out in Iraq's oil arena. I think if the Iraqis have, can come to agreement on how federalism is going to work in the entire country, um, that that could be very good for Iraq's overall governance and for its energy sector. But right now, the Iraqis aren't yet there. They have a lot of disagreements over who has the right to develop the oil. They have a lot of disagreements over under what kind of mechanisms and contracts um, the oil should be developed. And there's a lot of disagreement about should the provinces take the lead or should Baghdad take the lead in these endeavors. And not having an agreed position on this is what is actually inhibiting the energy sector more than I would say anything else. And it is the one thing that I would really focus on if you're interested in Iraq and interested in Iraq's potential um, to really bring oil to the international market and to translate that oil into uh, prosperity for its own citizens and stability for the region. Fascinating. Megan L. O'Sullivan, thanks so much for joining us on the line from Cambridge. We appreciate your time very much. Great. Thanks a lot, Steve.